of the Planning Board. Uh, the first order of business is a review and approval of the minutes of our meeting from June 20 of 2006. Uh, are there any comments or questions? Barbara. And before we proceed, is I'm just going to check with the town planner. Is our minute secretary going to be doing this via video? Yes. Okay, thank She's you. She's watching as we speak. Oh, okay. And rapt attention. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, Barbara. Um, let me just, add, I have a couple of things, but some of them are really minor. Maureen, may I just give those to you, like letters that are transposed? Dave, may I do that? These are just typographical. Typographical. I have a couple sub substantive, but Why don't you just I'll just give the substantive ones if I could. Um, there are only one or two. All right, point number 14. What page is On page 11, about cut through traffic, no vote was recorded. And I kept a record of all the votes. The vote on that was five to two. And I believe that's my recollection as well. I, and, okay. Okay, so that was just left out. And number 21 on page 12. It should read on the last sentence, drainage easements have been provided. Yes. One more, and I'm not sure whether it's... No, the, the others are all minor, and I will give them to Maureen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, with the minutes having, with those changes, is there a motion for approval for the minutes? So moved. There's a motion, is there a second? Seconded by David. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Motion carries. Uh, we have received some correspondence uh, prior to tonight's meeting. We have a letter from Richard Bryant regarding Spurwink Woods, a letter from W. Enman regarding Spurwink Woods, a memorandum from the Fire Chief McGoldrick regarding the Elliott Private Accessway Permit, a memorandum from the Code Enforcement Officer regarding the Elliott Private Accessway Permit, a memorandum from the Conservation Commission on the same topic, a letter from C. Vaniotis regarding the same topic, a letter from T. Egan dated July 11, 2006 on the same topic, a letter dated July 12, 2006 from T. Egan on the same topic, a letter from N. Ricker regarding Radigan application, and a letter from John Siegfried regarding uh, his resignation. And uh, John, thank you for coming here tonight. Uh, we have certainly enjoyed having you on the planning board and appreciate your willingness to come to tonight's meeting. So thank you. Uh, under old business, the first order is the Spurwink Woods subdivision reconsideration. We received a request from Richard Bryant of 55 Spurwink Avenue to reconsider the approval vote for the Spurwink Woods subdivision granted on June 20th of 2006. Uh, I just want to point out, and this is laid out in our memorandum from the uh, town planner, uh, that we are not required to reconsider this vote. However, if a member of the board wants to reconsider the decision, a board member who voted to approve the project last month may make a motion to reconsider. Uh, if such a motion is not made, then no further action is required. If a motion is made and there is no second to the motion, uh, then no further action is needed. Uh, so at this point, I would open it up to members of the board to determine if there is any member who wishes to make such a motion. I won't be making a motion. Seeing heads indicating no, so in light of that, I am not prepared to make a motion to reconsider either. Uh, so uh, we do not need to discuss this further. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the Elliott Private Accessway Permit Resource Protection Permit. Uh, Don Elliott is requesting a private accessway permit and resource protection permit for a lot located at 43 Hannaford Cove Road. The lot has less than 125 feet of road frontage, and the driveway will cross a wetland, altering 1,068 square feet. 
The application will be reviewed for compliance with Section 19-7-9 Private Access Way Permit and Section 19-8-3 Resource Protection Permit. At this point, uh, I see a representative of the applicant is here. Uh, when you are ready, sir, I would just ask that you summarize any changes that have been made to the plans and bring us up to date with this application. Okay. Uh, the revised plans are that we have we have a 20-foot radius now of pavement on the westerly side of the entrance from the Hannafin Cove Road. Um, there will still be a 10-foot radius on the easterly side. Uh, the required 40 feet by 24 feet has been revised and also Schedule A attached to the covenants for the maintenance agreement has been revised also. Uh, we have added a two inch water line uh, which shows on the other page. We have added a two inch water line uh, for the fire service to the sprinkler system for the proposed house, which was recommended. Uh, the proposed wall specifications that we have here are uh, our keystone wall uh, retaining wall systems. And we have supplied some colored pictures that you all have, I believe, in your packet showing that these walls uh, 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 very nice looking walls and they and they, and they have a good uh, amenity to them uh, we have added a guardrail that was suggested by host associates for a safety feature and going down there the guardrail uh, between guardrails it will limit about 11 and a half feet of width and um, we also uh, of course, as you know, you have a memorandum from <coughs> Phil McGoldrick, which says he believes he can get his ladder truck in there now with the change in this radius up on the westerly side and the turnaround uh, corrections that we have here. And uh, this 20-foot pavement width now will allow all emergency vehicles to come and go whenever necessary. Uh, that's about all I have. If you have any other questions, so those are the major changes that have been made. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a public hearing scheduled tonight. Does any member of the board wish to ask the applicant any questions before we open it up for a public hearing? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we do have a public hearing scheduled this evening, so anyone who wishes to comment on this application, please come to the podium, uh, identify yourself, and where you live or if you're here on behalf of someone, please identify that as well. Uh, and uh, I, it seems to me we might have a half a dozen or so folks, so I don't think we're pressed for time. So anyway, public hearing is now open. Thank you. My name is Tom Egan. I live with my family at 41 Hannaford Cove Road, which is the property to the west immediately adjacent to 43 Hannaford Cove Road which is the subject of these applications. Uh, tonight I prepared uh, some remarks I'd like to read to you. I'd like to offer a copy of them to you for the record in um, support of the other uh, documents that I have filed and that uh, on my behalf have been filed by um, Bernstein Schur, the law firm, uh, Chris Vaniotis, Esquire, and also by Will Haskell, uh, a professional engineer and, and um, I'm going to read this. A certified professional in erosion and sediment control who we hired to look at some of the drainage and uh, resource protection aspects. So um, I hope you'll give each of those gentlemen a little bit of time to explain their remarks and also feel free to ask them any questions that you might have that will help you in your deliberations. Uh, at the outset, and as a matter of housekeeping for the record, in addition to the letters submitted to you by our experts and a written copy of this statement, please refer to my May 15, 2006 letter to uh, Maureen O'Mara. In that letter, I listed the zoning ordinance provisions that the applications did not meet. With the exception of Part A of that letter, that's now two months old, um, 
dealing with the septic system that the CEO addressed this past week or before, and also with the exception of Part D3 of that letter, dealing with the turning radius that the, has been dealt with by Chief McGoldrick now, I restate each and every point in that uh, May 15 letter because they are valid and compelling reasons for these applications to be denied. For 26 years we've been at Hannaford Cove. My family has always spent time, effort, and some expense uh, in, an, in, an, in the effort to protect our property and to keep the quality of the environment and the neighborhood down there squared away. And it's, it's a great neighborhood and we've been successful. Um, the same objectives that we've always had are the objectives here. The proposed driveway at 43 Hannaford Cove is just 20 feet wide, 10 feet less than the ordinance standard, and too narrow for the site conditions. Blasting, excavation, construction, and maintenance within that narrow footprint uh, are going to take place within three inches of the boundary line, according to the uh, um, specifications and plans you have here, that activity is bound to spill over the boundary lines. I wish to make it clear that we will not accept any trespass or damage to our property in the course of excavation, construction, maintenance, uh, uh, of the, or maintenance of the proposed driveway. We also feel threatened by the prospect that a fire truck may not be able to get to the lot to fight a fire so close to our house. The steep drop-offs from the elevated driveway, I think it's up six feet now, or six feet or more, and the narrow travel way that is restricted, as you just heard, to 11 and a half feet between the guardrails, <laughs> leaves very little room for emergency vehicles and creates a risk that, a, that an emergency vehicle might not be able to get back there, whether in dry, snow, or icy conditions, and you'll hear later uh, from uh, Will Haskell about snow and, and how that snow and ice on that roadway. Now the public way standards of the zoning ordinance are designed to eliminate adverse impacts like these uh, with respect to a substandard lot like this that fails to meet safety standards and sound land planning. So you're being asked to make waivers, you're being asked to make exceptions, but there are adverse impacts and we want to highlight those. This proposal requires a very high re vertical retaining wall to hold up a driveway, a wall just inches from our property. Even with the proposed culvert, the driveway will create a barrier that will pond water upstream on our property. There has never been any ponding of water on our property anywhere near this proposed driveway. That swale is a very effective drainage ditch and there's not ponding anywhere on my property near where this driveway is, is about to go in, if indeed it does uh, pass your approval. Tonight, when you come to the resource protection standards of flooding and increase in surface waters, and look at those standards, please take particular care not to assume that the only impact of this wall driveway is the filling of 1,068 square feet of wetland your findings on these two points in particular must address the upstream and the downstream ponding and erosion impacts that will Haskell and your common sense will tell you what will occur. This wetland has served the neighborhood well, providing drainage down its natural swale and then it turns into a stream that goes to the ocean. Sixteen years ago and annually thereafter in the spring and sometimes in the fall, um, We've noticed the change of the type of vegetation in the wetland on the Okabaskis property next door that had not occurred prior to the construction of their driveway in 1989. Rob Yokobaskis has submitted to your file, and he has uh, some photographs here tonight, I think he'll, he'll show you, uh, that show the ponding of water upstream of his driveway in this swale. If the proposed driveway is built, the owner of the new home there, which is an abstraction at this point only, will, have, will not have ponding of water on his property. The flooding and increase of surface water and erosion will be on my property because the driveway takes up all of his property in the wetland. 
Uh, at the beginning of my remarks, I said that we will not accept trespass or damage to our property in the course of excavation, construction, or maintenance of the driveway. Likewise, we want to be clear that we will not accept bonding or erosion on our property that will occur if the proposed wall driveway across that wetland is constructed. Please bear in mind that when vegetation and ground on the Elliott property are removed and replaced with buildings, and the buildings again are mere abstractions at this point, we don't know how big they are or where they are specifically, sheeting of additional water from the roofs and elsewhere will spill into that wetland, that's my land, making ponding worse. So in other words, you're taking a vegetative area and turning it into impervious structures that are referred to in the ordinance, and that water, increased water, is going to come into the wetland. This is yet another reason why we hope you will concur with Will Haskell that you require a watershed plan, erosion protection, and drainage easements. Now as I close, we acknowledge that we have provided to you a lot of site data, science, engineering information, and points of law. We hired a wetland scientist back in December, whose report is in your file, to delineate the baseline condition of this valuable and attractive wetland that should not be damaged. We hired a surveyor whose topical gra uh, topographical map is also in your file. Uh, in order to correctly set boundaries, especially in this 20-foot area that were misstated or uh, that were mismarked last year, and also we asked him to provide the elevation so we could determine how much of our land will be affected by erosion and the ponding upstream in the swale of this wall driveway. We hired an engineer, Will, whose recommendations are also in your file to explain best practices and the code standards that apply to the ap applications and for his objective balance. And finally, we hired Chris Vaniotis and his law firm to address procedures and legal issues in this matter that will affect our home and the neighborhood for a long time to come. To the extent the planning board becomes familiar with all of the materials and positions that we've provided and, and done so in good faith, I have no doubt that your consideration of the applications will be undertaken with care, impartiality, and with common sense. Finally, we remain convinced that the application for an access way permit is premature. Without an actual residence development plan for you to consider, the application is abstract and incomplete. The criteria and the findings that you make tonight, or at a later date if you elect to do so, uh, though binding on the lot owner, the ultimate lot owner who purchases this property, those criteria and findings may not address the implications of site preparation and construction of a residence not yet specified. That risk should not be borne by us. We do not want to go through this time-consuming and expensive process again, and we don't think that the planning board or the, the planning office does either. Therefore, we ask the board to wait until an actual development plan is proposed. That concludes my remarks. I'll, I'll offer a, a written copy of them. And, and uh, again, I invite you to uh, hear um, Will Haskell and uh, Chris Vanniotis. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take a copy of your remarks. Thanks. Anyone else wishing to speak? Mr. Haskell? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, prepared a letter for Mr. Egan dated July 11th, which I believe you probably have in your packet. Uh, I would just like to touch on a few uh, items relative to the resource protection application uh, submissions and the private access way application submissions. Um, and specifically as they relate to the, to the standards for each of those as outlined in your ordinance. Uh, so I'll start with the resource protection application standards in section 19-8-3. 
Uh, standards 1, 2, and 3 on page 176 of the ordinance uh, specifically relate to drainage, uh, obstruction of natural flow, and not threatening upstream or downstream waters by flooding, erosion, or otherwise. Uh, we believe, based on the information that was submitted, uh, that we've reviewed in the file, uh, there was a, uh, a hydraulic analysis that was completed uh, by the applicant, uh, for the applicant, that, that uh, presents uh, calculations for the culvert for the 210 and 25 year storms. Uh, for the higher storm events, uh, based on those calculations, we believe that there will be ponding upstream of the proposed culvert. Uh, they're proposing to use a 12-inch culvert in this case, and while the calculations show that the 12-inch culvert will convey uh, the 25-year storm, uh, it, it actually conveys it under pressure or in a surcharged condition, so there will actually be ponding uh, upstream of that culvert. And in addition to that, uh, the velocities through that culvert um, get quite uh, increase significantly. Uh, the velocities as shown in the calculations exceed six feet per second and approach eight feet per second I think in the in the 25 year storm. Uh, vegetated soil depending on the soil uh, the, the type of soil and the nature of the vegetation typically can only handle velocities of three to four feet per second. So in other words by funneling this the water that flows down this 50 to 60 foot wide wetland into a 12 inch culvert, uh, we're going to be creating velocities at the inlet of that culvert where the water goes into the culvert and where it exits that culvert, which would normally be addressed by some sort of permanent erosion protection, which in this case, since the roadway uh, fills up the entire 20.63 foot right of way, there's no room to add those types of protections on either end. Uh, that is a, a concern that we believe will, uh, will have a negative impact on the upstream and downstream properties uh, next to this, this roadway. Um, the other concern we have with the, with the drainage information that's been presented is there's really no information in the calculations in terms of how the peak flows were, were calculated. Uh, they, they provide uh, a culvert calculation with a peak flow but they don't show how that peak flow was calculated. So we would recommend that the, the board require the applicant, as suggested in your ordinance, uh, to submit a drainage plan, uh, watershed maps, and drainage calculations, either by the rational method or TR-55 or some other method that would show how those flows are calculated in this case so we can verify uh, uh, their accuracy. Um, Standard 10 in the resource protection standards uh, relates to erosion control. Uh, in reviewing the application, we, we noticed in the, uh, in the planner's most recent memo that erosion control had been addressed by the applicant. Uh, we did not find um, such... Oh, sorry about that. We didn't find any erosion control notes or information on the plans uh, dealing with silt fence, uh, check dams, or any other such typical erosion control measures or best management practices. So we'd be, we'd be interested in reviewing those if they are in the file, but we weren't able to, uh, to find those in the, in the application file. Uh, I think I'll move on to the private access way application standards at this point in section 19.7-9. Uh, highlighted a couple things on a plan here. I'm not sure I can put it up. Same plan that's underneath. I just highlighted a couple items there. But I'd like to start with standard 4B1 um, relative to uh, it's a standard requiring a 30-foot wide right-of-way, which the applicant has asked for a waiver on. Uh, the existing right-of-way that's out there is 20.63 feet. 
in a normal situation where you didn't have a lot of grade to work with and you, and you weren't required to build these retaining walls on either side of a driveway, it might be feasible to, to fit that in a narrower right-of-way. In this case, the width of that road from edge of footing to edge of footing is 20 feet, which leaves about 0.6 feet, 0.63 feet uh, of remaining space in that right-of-way. Uh, on, on, uh, so that would be split, so it would be half of that, it would be on either side. It's going to be very difficult for a, a, a contractor to construct this road in that, in that width, uh, given that it's, it's right up against those right-of-way lines without encroaching on or impacting the abutting properties. Uh, so we just feel that it would be appropriate to request some additional information in terms of how this is going to be built without encroaching over and requiring construction easements or, or some sort of easement to work on abutting properties, which uh, at this point I don't believe the abutters are, are willing to grant. So uh, I think there needs to be some clear uh, information presented in terms of how this is going to be built within that, within that narrow right-of-way. Uh, I guess we also concur, I believe this was touched on by the town's engineer uh, relative to the, the, the narrow width between the guardrails, and I know Mr. Egan uh, discussed this as well, that uh, there's definitely some concern about the access of emergency vehicles getting down through there. Uh, fire trucks, large tanker trucks, fire trucks are on the order of eight and a half to nine feet wide. Uh, some of them are up to 10 feet wide. You've got 11 and a half feet of clear space in between those guardrails, so that leaves uh, anywhere from a foot and a half, foot to a foot and a half of, of clear space between those guardrails. Uh, in the wintertime, with snow banks on either side, it's more than likely going to be narrowed down even more than that. So just. Um, the other item that the town engineer touched on is uh, clearing limits associated with the site distance. Uh, we concur that there is, would be adequate site distance out there with some clearing along Hannaford Cove Road. I think we just want to make sure that the clearing is not going to occur on the abutting properties to, to get that site distance. So it would be uh, beneficial to see that uh, delineated on the plan. I guess the other concern that we have uh, is the plans present a, a detailed road section for the, for the fill section, in other words, where it crosses the wetland area in this area here. What it doesn't show is in the first 60 feet of the road, once you come off Hannaford Cove Road, there's actually a cut section. Uh, in other words, they have to cut down about three and a half feet of the, of the existing hill that's here and we really don't have any details in terms of how that's going to be constructed. Uh, so that is uh, of a concern because we don't know how that's going to impact uh, the abutting properties. Will the, will the cut slopes on either side extend out beyond the, uh, the right-of-way line? Uh, we don't really know because there's no detail to, to, uh, to indicate uh, what's going to happen there. So uh, we believe that there, there needs to be another road uh, section detail that shows what's going to happen in that area with the three and a half foot cut. Uh, I think with that, I've, what's that? Oh, all right, yeah, one, one other item, um, and the town engineer has also addressed this, deals with uh, the surface drainage off of the access road. Uh, Currently, uh, the design does not include any type of, of, of drainage feature to remove runoff from the road and, and uh, discharge it down into the adjacent wetland. Typically, there might be a catch basin or, or something up here to collect water. So what's going to happen uh, as it's currently designed is water will run down that road and pond at the low point down at the bottom of the hill here uh, until it builds up high enough uh, to flow over this uh, slight berm that's on either side of the roadway and spill down over the edge of the retaining walls. Um, that could be a safety issue for emergency vehicles, uh, especially in colder months where it might freeze. Uh, you might end up with a, a frozen 
sheet of ice down at the bottom of the bottom of this uh, this hill here, uh, which could present problems for vehicles negotiating that area in, in colder times. Uh, so I think with that, I've covered most of my items. And uh, if you have any questions, be free to. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions now, or should we wait till the full presentation? Uh, we're only hearing from a few people. I don't mind if. If you want to ask a question now, it might be sure. easier for the rest of the board, if that's OK. Go ahead. The question I have is, I've heard the term ponding used twice, but I don't see that anywhere in the regulation. Can you tell me what you mean by it exactly and how that re relates to the, the uh, specifically the resource protection permit standards? Sure. Um, and specifically, which one you think it violates? In 19-8-3, B, uh, items one, two, and three, uh, these are in the resource protection permit standards, relate to drainage. And if you look at item three, uh, uh, the, the last couple lines there, uh, well, I'll read the whole thing. It says, will not increase flow of surface waters across or discharge of surface waters from the alteration area so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to the upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, draining, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. Uh, so flooding is ponding. Um, and in this case, you're, you're restricting the, the flow through this 50 to 60 foot wide right. wetland. Right, right. Uh, by putting in a culvert. And it's Flood, flooding per se isn't prohibited by this regulation, though. You have to show. If, you're, if you don't comply, that you do one of these other things in here, threaten injury to the altered area, et cetera, et cetera. So ponding in and of itself wouldn't be a violation of B3. Isn't that right? If flooding equates to ponding, which I'm not sure I buy either, but accepting that, don't you have to show something more than just flooding? Um, I guess I would uh, tend to disagree with that. Uh, Why? Because it's, you're flooding someone else's property. Uh, you're creating a drainage condition on someone else's property that wasn't there previously. Uh, you're, you're ponding water on someone else's property that wasn't occurring previously by installing a culvert that restricts the flow through the... Okay. And, and why, is it flood, why is it ponding? In your, in your professional opinion, why would it be ponding? Uh, it, it basically because the culvert is undersized. Okay. So if the culvert were adequately sized, there would be no ponding. Is that right? Possible. Possible. Yep. Well, what, what, at what size, in your professional opinion, would it need to be in order to not have any ponding or violation of any of these standards? I'd need to see the, as I indicated, I'd need to see the drainage map and the, the calculation showing what the flows are through there to determine. How, how do you know that it's going to pond given what you see if you, if you can't tell me what won't pond? I'm how, basing that kind of off of the information that was presented in the application. Uh, the, the, the peak flows that were presented in the application which don't really, there's no documentation in terms of how those peak flows were arrived at. Okay. I don't have any other questions at this point. Anybody else have questions at this point? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else wish to speak on this application? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the board. My name is Chris Vaniotis, and I'm a legal counsel for Tom Egan. Uh, we thank the chair for the invitation at the beginning that we could take a little bit of time with this. Uh, we'll try not to abuse that privilege. That's a, a very dangerous thing to say when there's a lawyer or two in the room. But I don't intend to go over everything that I've submitted to you in writing already. I'd just like to take some of the same points and approach them perhaps from a slightly different angle that will be helpful to the board. Um, certainly the board might be sitting there and thinking, gee, this is much ado over what is essentially likely to be a single family house. But I think many of you have seen the site, you've seen the wetland, you've seen the topography of the site. Uh, we have a couple of neighbors here. I represent one of them. I know you're going to hear from another one who are very concerned about squeezing this fairly substantial piece of construction. 
not your run-of-the-mill driveway, but a fairly substantial piece of construction into only 20 feet, where on either side of that 20 feet, they have the potential to be encroaching upon and causing damage to the abutting properties. And uh, I know the question came to Will Haskell, but I guess I would respectfully suggest to, to the board member that if my property is high and dry and somebody is going to flood it even temporarily with ponding, that's damaged my property. That's impaired my ability to use my property. So for that reason, Mr. Egan and Mr. Yokobaskis on the other side are very concerned about the possible impacts of this construction within the 20 feet. And just if I could jump in, um, even if that flooding or ponding were to occur in the delineated wetland areas, your client would take that position that it's damaging to the property? I, th I think, I think if, if, if you look at the ordinance provisions in section 1983, and uh, Will, Will Haskell referred to, to one of them, but if you look at all three of them all together, I think clearly that that's what the ordinance is saying. Number one is will not materially obstruct the flow of surface or subsurface wastewaters across or from the alteration areas. Will Haskell has indicated that as designed, this will create an obstruction. Number two, will not impound surface waters or reduce the absorptive capacity of the alteration area so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties. Uh, yes, I think wherever it occurs on property that is not the subject property, uh, the ordinance is saying that those impacts should not be allowed to occur. And number three is also the one Will Haskell referred to, which also talks about what I think is just as important as the ponding here, and that is the uh, erosion and sedimentation. And as Will has indicated, with the velocities that would be created as this project is currently designed, both going into the culvert and coming out of the culvert, uh, in his view, there is very likely to be erosion, both on the Egan property and on the adjacent property, the Yogabascus property. And the only way to address that from an engineering perspective would be to build some kind of permanent structure at the inlet and the outlet of the culvert. But the problem is there's no room at the inlet or the outlet of the culvert to build any kind of permanent structure. If this proposed road were being built by the main department of transportation or the town of Cape Elizabeth, they would be coming to the abutting property owners and saying, please give us a drainage easement on either side please give us a construction easement on either side so that we can construct this road with the ability to come onto your property both temporarily and also permanently to deal with erosion, to deal with drainage. And that's not happening here. So the ordinance really requires the property owner here to stay within the confines of his or her own property. And I'm kind of circling around here, but one of the points I make in my letter is I think the board has to satisfy itself that the applicant has demonstrated to you, to your satisfaction, that the applicant can actually propose, uh, can actually do what the applicant has proposed to do. And in this case, that means doing it from an engineering perspective without encroaching upon, without trespassing upon the abutting properties. Uh, I promised I wouldn't repeat everything I've said in my letter, so with that, I will, that's one of the points in the letter. Um, and that's the standing point, to use the legal terminology. I want to talk a little bit more about the whole concept of the waivers that the applicant is requesting. Uh, what your ordinance says is that the planning board may reduce the requirements of subsections 1, 2, and 3 of 1917D94B uh, to a lesser standard where there is an existing private access, which is not the case here, or to promote better neighborhood development. And that, I think, takes us back to the purpose of the private access way provisions, which is to allow development on what is otherwise a non-conforming lot. And non-conforming lots which don't have sufficient street frontage need special attention because without the sufficient street front frontage, they necessarily are going to be closer to neighbors when they're developed than conforming lots. Typically, they're going to be back lots behind somebody's property, which is exactly what we have here. The private access way provisions of the ordinance say that the planning board can approve development on a non-conforming lot if, and I think the word if is extremely important there, if adequate access is provided, if the development is carried out in a manner that minimizes the impact on adjacent properties, and if it's consistent with sound neighborhood development. 
And then we go to the waiver standard of the ordinance, which essentially says that the planning board can approve waivers from what is otherwise required for a private access way only if the planning board finds that granting the waiver will promote better neighborhood development than if the development occurred without the waiver. Uh, you've heard from Mr. Egan, you've heard from Will Haskell about all the reasons why, at least on the face of this application and the information that's been presented to you so far, it appears that granting waivers here and allowing development of this lot uh, with this engineered road will do just the opposite. It will not improve neighborhood development. Uh, it will not promote better neighborhood development, but it has a serious um, uh, potential described by an engineer for adverse impacts on the neighboring properties as it's defined. Um, last comments I'll make at this point is that well, two, actually. One, <laughs> one, is, one is extremely quick. We looked at the planner's memo, and we note that the planner's memo in the proposed motion doesn't have proposed findings of fact for the wetlands alteration standards, uh, the resource protection standards. Those were discussed in the planner's memo, but we don't see some findings of fact there. And we would urge the board, certainly, to look at the standards one by one, especially standards one, two, and three that Will Haskell discussed, and standard 10, uh, and make sure that the board is satisfied that this application meets those standards. The second point, also related to the planner's memo, is the planner uh, offers the board the option of approving this with some conditions that the applicant meet a series of um, issues raised in the report from the town's consulting engineer, Oast Associates. Um, one of those issues raised by Oast Associates is the whole business of the guardrails. And in the Oast Associates report, you will see that they actually recommend that the width of the road not be reduced by those guardrails, that the guardrails be redesigned so that the width can be kept at least at the 16 feet that the waiver would get it down to. And I think it's interesting to look at the uh, report from the fire chief. And of course, the chief isn't here, so I don't want to put words in his mouth. But it appears that the fire chief looked at the turning radius. And indeed, the applicant has fixed the turning radius on one side of the property so that uh, uh, it meets the standards. But it's not clear to me, uh, from this letter at least, that the fire chief has yet addressed the whole issue of getting his trucks, it's not his trucks, the town's trucks, uh, through the 12 point, or is it 11.5 feet? The 11.5 feet that would be left by the guardrails. And Oast Associates looks at the guardrails and says, we recommend they be moved back so that there is at least 16 feet of travel way there. But then again, raises the question, can that be done from an engineering perspective without encroaching on the neighbor's property? Because a guardrail needs a fair amount of support to hold it up and to be able to withstand the weight of a vehicle pressing against it. We suggest that the board needs answers to those questions and that if the board isn't satisfied, the board really shouldn't say, approved with the condition that those issues be addressed because those, those issues really go to the fundamental engineering of this project and to compliance with the ordinance standards in a way that if the board isn't satisfied, uh, the board should ask the applicant to come back and address those issues. Uh, finally, we think the application as it is currently structured doesn't meet the standards for the reasons we've described. Thank you. Uh, does anybody else wish to speak? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm Rob Yokobaskis. Um, I'm another one of the abutters. I'm at 45 Hannaford Cove Road. And in my humble opinion, I believe our property would be the most affected by this uh, due to the sight lines and drainage and other things that have already been mentioned here. Um, our property is only 120 feet wide, so we're very sensitive to things along our border. Um, we feel that a 180-foot segmented wall with a guardrail that looms at approximately eight feet um, is out of place in our neighborhood or in Cape Elizabeth, for that matter. Um, I think it is unprecedent, unprecedented in this community. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why it points out the, this potential project um, points out the perils of why uh, the ordinance states that 30 feet is required. Um, 
we had some extra landscape fabric around and we built just because I couldn't visualize the wall so we made one and uh, some of the board members did get a chance to see it but I took the liberty to make some photos and if you'd like I would pass them around just to get an idea of the scope and please recognize that this is only six feet tall there's no, you'd have to imagine the guardrail in here, which is another two, I think, 2.4 feet above this level. And I just, I quite frankly can't do that, but I thought maybe if I pass these around, and it's only 100 feet long, not the 180 feet that's proposed. Uh, uh, we would like to see those. Is that okay if we retain them as part of the record? Please, okay. Please Feel free to do so. And then um, my next point would be the drainage in our area has been problematic in the past and will probably continually to be that way. And uh, one of the events that happened that I wish I did have a picture of was you know, the fall flood of 1996. Um, I have a 15-inch culvert in my driveway and um, it was overwhelmed and the water came up and went over the driveway top of the driveway. So I don't know if that was a 25-year event or a 101-year event, um, but I, I did do a little research and I guess that we had 6.32 inches of rain, which is two times normal than that for any October we've had, I guess, um, in quite a number of years. And that's why I guess it, it, um, it overwhelmed the 15-inch culvert, so I'm not a rocket scientist, and um, I don't pretend to be one, or do I play one on TV, but this, uh, it would make me wonder why they think a 12-inch culvert would work when my 15-inch one doesn't work. So that's just another question that I have. And I also took the liberty of making a photograph of this is a recent storm that we had that shows, I guess, the ponding or the flooding, if you will, in that area and I think it would be exacerbated by having another type driveway like my own. And where is the area of that photo? Is that on your property? This is, this is on my property in front and you'll notice my driveway is here to the left and the proposed driveway is along the right bank. Right. Thank you. Um, and then getting on to some of the aesthetic um, attributes of this proposed project. Um, we have also identified five trees along the property line, three of which are mature, um, that clearly are on our land, but um, we would they would lose half of their root systems. Um, and so we feel that most likely they would perish. And we're wondering, you know, who would be responsible for that? How would they be replaced? They are val valuable buffer to us right now. And in the future, you know, we would like to continue to have them, obviously. And if this was constructed, we don't know if they would make it. Um, and then in a situation like this where you have problems with access, flooding, drainage, and aesthetics, um, you have to be very careful about what you do. Um, and I just wonder if it is in the best interest of our neighborhood, because I don't feel that, you know, I, I guess I'm the most impacted, so I'd have to look at it on a daily basis. But um, I just wonder if it's just development at any cost. And I just wonder if that's the correct way to proceed. But that's not for me to decide. But I thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Barbara. You had a question? Thank you. Sure. Um, May and June were the rainiest months on the May, rainiest May and June on record and I, you alluded to this but I wasn't quite clear sure. during May and June um, was it both months that your 15 inch culvert was inadequate I, I mean the well it wasn't it didn't flood like it did in 1996 it didn't go over the road I mean we didn't have I guess it wasn't a hundred and one year event I don't think it was 6.32 inches, and, and I'm, I don't know if that's correct for this past season, but this season was enough that it did show the flooding that's in those pictures that is in the, my letter to the file of um, May 15th and also one of the ones yes. I just passed around. So that was this season. How long did that, we had a, a long period of rain, how long did the ponding or flooding, whatever anybody wants to call it, remain on your property? Well, still, I mean, there's always been vernal pools or there's been some, um, I guess, uh, 
containment of water in that little area. I think originally before I moved in, I think the Egans would concur that there was a little kind of pond area there to begin with. Very small. Very small though. And um, I think now that they put the culvert, I don't know whether it's because my driveway, the, the culvert is positioned too high or too low, but it, it, I always have water there now. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Can I ask a question? Um, you mentioned sure. 1996. I, I, so I was your neighbor down there for a few months in 1998. Oh, okay. Right. October of 98, we had a horrendous, uh, I don't know, it was a tropical storm that had near me us. And I, yeah. I, I, I walked Panacoco Road. I, used to, I was on Rocky Point Lane. I recall you had an overflow at that point, too, didn't you, in 1998? I, you, you could be correct. You could be correct. We've had overflows at a couple of different yeah. points during those time periods. But I, I specifically remember the 1996 one because I remember driving home and I drove through South Portland. There were a lot of roads that were closed. Right. And you could not get access. We had to you know, take a really circuitous route to get home. Yeah. And um, I found, I said, well, gee, I hope you know, my driveway isn't flooded. And sure enough, it was coming up over the top of the driveway. And I just kind of went through it to make it. Thank God the house is high enough so we didn't have any issues with, um, with uh, water. But, um, you, you, you could be correct. Yeah. And most it's, likely are. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're, uh, just, we actually are going to come back to the applicant once we conclude the public hearing. And we're going to ask you folks to address a lot of the issues that have been raised by Butters and also in response to, to planning board questions. But is there anybody else who wishes to speak on this application? Could I go back to address a point that you raised just very briefly? Is it possible for me to come around? That's it. Yeah, we, we typically don't have offer opportunities for rebuttal in the public hearing, and we have actually gone for over 45 minutes. Uh, so I would like to, uh, if there's anybody else who hasn't spoken yet, okay, then at this point, we'll conclude the public hearing. Uh, we, I believe there'll be a lot of questions now for the applicant at this point. So I would ask its consultant, and sir, I'm not sure you actually identified yourself on the record. So if you could, when you come back to the podium, I'd appreciate that. My name is Herbert P. Gray, and I'm a consulting engineer uh, working for Mr. Elliott. Okay. And, um, I'd like to go back to Host Associates uh, review subject uh, dated May 10th, 2006. And in that, uh, he said on April 28th, stormwater management report for the proposed 12 inch diameter culvert was submitted and prepared by the engineering firm of Edwards and Kelsey of Portland, Maine and was sealed by a main professional engineer. We concur with the findings of this report. And that's written by Stephen D. Harding, an engineer, town engineer, that's working for Host Associates. Also in this letter, uh, he says, the designer may wish to consider the installation of the guardrail sections in the area of the highest fill section. He didn't say where the guardrail should be put or what was left over. And I can show you that in the Keystone recommended reports that that guardrail is listed three feet from the end, which we have dimensioned right there, which is exactly according to the Keystone specifications for guardrail with this type of wall. Uh, and as far as the aesthetics are concerned about this wall, I think these colored pictures certainly will uh, show you that with careful construction that this wall will look very nice. And as far as increasing the size of the culvert, it's fine with us. I, if they want to increase the size of the culvert, it won't hurt our design one bit. Matter of fact, probably help it in the downstream section. But the whole thing is that a report was uh, was submitted and it was approved by the town engineer and he concurred with everything uh, that Edwards and Kelsey uh, suggested. So, I mean, you've got engineers that will tell you all kinds of things and they're probably right. I'm not saying they're wrong. All I'm saying is we did submit a report. It was accepted by the town engineer and he concurred with it. But as far as making that culvert larger, we could, definitely we could make it larger and it won't hurt one thing. We still have a tight B under drains come into it. 
which is going to, as long as it isn't frozen, we'll take water that drifts down through. This is all a gravel borrow and, uh, and, uh, and gravel all the way through there. The water will seep through. When it is frozen, it'll probably be without a question. Uh, there might be some water spill over the wall, but there again, if we want to increase the size of the pipe, it certainly would reduce, would reduce bonding, and uh, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. I, if you could stay at the podium, sir, I, I'm sure there are going to be some questions for you. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? David. One, David. One quick question, Herb. What is the actual width between the guardrails that you Approximately 11 and a half feet, stated right in my... Uh, yeah. And, the, and uh, to my knowledge, and uh, it isn't my knowledge, but, but Phil McGoldrick wrote the memorandum, and I believe... I'm not sure, his ladder truck is either eight or eight and a half feet wide. And he feels, according to his memorandum, that he can get his ladder truck up, up and in there. And that's the biggest vehicle that the town has. Yeah. Barbara? Nobody's ever talked, and it's been brought up several times, about snow removal and getting things on. Um, this is the most complicated, <laughs> truthfully, I've ever seen for one little lot. Well, and I really have another question I'm burning to ask. But <laughs> why, don't, why don't I go ahead and just ask it? Has there been a discussion with the abutters about uh, easements yes. or purchasing uh, uh, adjacent? We, we asked both to abutters. try to address we the concerns. We asked both abutters before we started if we could get a 12 foot easement uh, on either side, uh, and there would be no wall at all. There would be, it would be side slopes, and everything would be taken care of in an orderly manner, and we, we got no takers. They, were, there was not, and they weren't interested. What about selling the lot to the three abutters at a reasonable price so everybody wins and we don't have to have this construction? As far as I know, no one's willing to pay the price. I don't know. Well, you I have mean, to that's set not a my. That's you not have my, to negotiate uh, that. That's not. That's not my. Uh, that's no, no, my, I know it's, that. It's, it's not. Your, has no. there been any discussion of that at all? This is a very complicated package for a single-family residence, both for the developer and for the abutter. Well, I, I, anyway, I, I, I guess. We I understand. I think uh, it's something we as a planning board hope if parties can work out their differences terrific if they can't they can't so we deal with the application as it's presented to us okay. um, uh, are there do you have additional I, questions I wanted on? to know about the snow removal I we well, got snow removal and can be removed uh, just I, like they do it in the city of Portland it's a little expensive well, they always push it to the side but no yeah well not all no no they don't know so you come in there with a truck and you and you have a, a snow blower and he comes around and he funnels it right up right into the truck. The snow removal can be taken care of basically uh, uh, without a Cape problem, Elizabeth but it will be expensive. It doesn't have those. Cape Elizabeth plows the roads. No. Oh, a private, Cape Elizabeth oh, private will driveway. not plow. The only thing they plow is Hannaford Cove Road. This is all private. Okay. okay. Any other questions? What, how do you respond to the abutters' concerns uh, about constructing the roadway and the wall, and and is that possible to do without encroaching onto their property? I guess it depends on the contractor. I mean, the only thing I can do is, uh, you know, I I can't speak for for the contractor on something like that, but. Uh, the lines are very definitely marked, and you know, uh, if they had to, I'm sure they could, uh, most contractors can find a way to uh, be a minimum. I don't know, I, I, I can't speak for that. Okay. It, 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 do you have an opinion, uh, based on your years of experience, that this type of uh, roadway or access way could be built, and along with that? I think it could be built, without, yeah. without, well, I understand that, but without, having to encroach upon the abutter's property? Yeah, well, I mean, it's 20 feet wide. You know, you're going to have to excavate from the middle and then just work at the sides, make sure you don't encroach. And what I mean, uh, and there's ledge, of course, in this area here. They're going to have to go in there and shear the ledge without a question. 
But I mean, uh, it's still out of line. I mean, it's 20 feet wide, so if they sheared the ledge to get 16 feet wide, they got two feet on both sides. So I mean, they, it might be a steep shear, but, it, but it's going to be ledge. It isn't going to erode. David? Yeah, just continue on that herb a little bit. It, it, what's the depth of that shear? How, how much excavation are you going to have to take out in depth? Oh, in this road? Yeah. I think you said in the green areas where you're going to have to go In the green the areas. Area. Yeah, it shows right here. It shows very clear. Perfect. Each one of these squares is one foot. Okay, so it's... Okay, so you've got one, two, uh, three plus four. It's going to be, to get down for the gravel and all, you're going to have, at the very peak, it'd be one, two, three, four, possibly four and a half to five feet, something in there, but it does slope off very close. That's just one in the one very peak area. Now, do you have to build up any area other oh, yeah. than where oh, the bridge is? It's got to be built up right here. Oh, sure. That's, other, and that's other, all built, as shown here, through the wetland area. And we've got our elevations all shown right there, what they are, what they will be. And uh, if it will, uh, as I say, if it will relieve the, uh, if it will relieve the uh, neighbors, we're willing to increase the size of the pipe. That's, uh, but we did have a report done, and it was accepted by the town engineer for the 12-inch pipe. But to be good neighbors, as far as we're concerned, we'll increase the size of the pipe. They'd like us to. John. Yeah, I had a question for Maureen, and it, it has to do with 1979C, and I, where it says that the planning board has the ability to approve substandard lots or non-conforming lots, and it says planning board to approve the developments of an individual lot lacking the required street frontage. If adequate access is provided to the lot, the development is carried out in a manner that minimizes the impact on adjacent properties. Is are, is are we just interpreting what this minimizes mean? Because minimize to me means it doesn't mean none. It means yeah. minimize. So <laughs> is that what we're trying to work around here? In an <laughs> I, I mean, has it? That's is that what, mean that someone that can is walk exactly on? the interpretation that's usually been used by the board. It doesn't mean that there's no impact at all. It means that any effort that can be made to reduce the impact on abutting properties should be made by the applicant, regardless of the impact on the applicant, as long as the applicant still can continue with the project as proposed. So, for example, there have been private access way permits where the 30-foot right-of-way, the driveway is supposed to be placed in the middle of the right-of-way. The planning board on occasion has allowed uh, the applicant to, to shift the road out of the center of the right-of-way to serve trees that were going to provide buffering. I mean, that's a classic example of things the board has done to minimize impact. Go ahead, Barbara. Um, Maureen, has, has a structure like this ever been granted before in Cape Elizabeth? Excuse me? Has a structure like this ever been granted in a residential neighborhood like this before? Has a, Is there any precedent? Has a structure? Like this road with the like build this, up? There's actually a bridge in Dyer Pond, which has been referenced when we've been reviewing this particular application. There's a, there's a lot near the end of Dyer Pond Road that there's a very deep ravine, and I there's place. actually a substantial bridge that was built that is the driveway for the lot. So I don't know if you're going to consider that comparable or not, but. Was that part of an overall development scheme? That was part that? of the subdivision right. application review. So it wasn't as if that was built in between existing homes. It was all part of a part subdivision of plan? Plan development. Okay. Thing, yes. uh, another question, there have been a lot of questions about the stormwater runoff and how the calculations were made. Can you respond to the report that the, or is somebody here? Yeah, I have. Uh, respond to the report that Mr. Haskell did for the abutters and his question about how the stormwater runoff was calculated. Could you give well, us a little bit more insight on that, please? I, we, I have a copy of the report here. Uh, all I can tell you is right now, I haven't, I didn't realize that was going to be an issue because 
according to Oast, that was behind us. They had already seen his report. They say right in their letter that they concur with his report. And uh, so we, I thought we would pass that. But if we're not past that, then they'd like to increase the size of the pipe. But according to the engineer that I hired, who was registered in the state of Maine, and the engineer that reviewed the uh, pit, reviewed them for you, host associates, their engineer, concurred with our engineer. Uh, you know, so, but this engineer says, and he's probably right to, to some extent, that a larger pipe wouldn't cause so much damage. That's fine with us. We'll put a larger pipe in. Does the report that you have, does it have the data that, that explains yes. how it was calculated? Yes, it does. I just read it to you. It was, uh, uh, the OST letter what, is what, dated oh. May 10th, 2006. Right here. Uh, you've got it. You're fine. Uh, right, but did you, did you, did you have someone calculate the drainage? Yes, I had, form? yes. And that's it, the data. That, that engineering it. firm was, was Edwards and Kelsey of Portland, Maine. Okay. And it was sealed by a professional engineer. And uh, I've got a copy of the report if you want it, but it's in your file. Okay, okay. It's in here. It's, you'll see it's got all the hydrographs yep. yep. that go up and down. <laughs> and I believe there was a letter that went with it that probably ex will explain everything better than those are hard to read sometimes unless you <laughs> know what you're reading. Go ahead, Barbara. Another question that was raised was about removing vegetation in order to have enough sight distance in and out of the driveway to increase your sight distance. I can't remember which side it was. Yeah, remember on the sight distance when we were out there, I right. showed you. You showed us, you but showed, it's all that vegetation a, in the right of way, right. or is it on right. a and butter's we do property? Have, we do have enough sight distance. If these shrubs right here, which are definitely on Mr. Egan's land as far as the bottom of them, but they grow up and hang over, and there's a, there's a huge amount of shrubbery right around that pole number 17 that uh, Central Maine Power has there. That all has to be cleared out. To get well, my right, question was, get, I remember that. Act, yes, but I mean, it's in the road right away. It's, uh, you know. Is it in the right of way or is it on Mr. Egan's property? You just no, said it was it's on, on the road right away. The, the, when we were out there, remember we showed yes, you the irons? That. Yeah. And you showed you the line of the road right away, which is very straight in this, in this uh, direction, right here, the line of the road right away. Actually, the road comes over on this side of the right of way, Hannaford Cove Road does. And it's a good thing for us it did, because that's the only reason we got a 20 foot radius. But, uh, and, but the actual road right away goes right across there, which is quite a, what gives you quite a, Quite a bit there that you can clear. I was a bit confused by your, your last answer, and I was talking to the town planner to try to get some clarification, just to make sure I understand the bushes or the trees are actually on Mr. Egan's property, but they, the roots, so, the roots the are, bushes okay. are on his property. And so the overhang that the you're overhang, talking about. Right. Those things have never been, was no, as far as I know, I, well, maybe they're trimmed now, but they never were trimmed ever since I've been out there. And, and, this, uh, and the stuff right around this Central Main Power number 17 is very tall. Matter of fact, it's all those bushes in there have been allowed over the years to grow, and they definitely have to be cut to get a sight distance. So when you're talking about cut, you're talking about trimming. Trimming. Oh, yeah. The overhang into the right of way as opposed right. to... Chop oh, yeah, no, we aren't chopping anything, dog. No. I just have a question for the town planner. Uh, it, it seems implausible to me that this 
can be built without encroaching on the neighbor's property, given the size. Uh, in the absence of the agreement of the abutters, is this simply a, an enforcement issue? They, if we were to approve this project and they send in the bulldozers and start working and blasting, et cetera, and they encroach the property, then they call the town out to stop it? Well, it's, it wouldn't be the town. Go ahead. Yeah. I've asked the town engineer these questions, and no. Is this the ideal situation? No, it is not. But I mean, he, he has been unable to say to me, black and white, it can't be done. He's saying, yeah, you know, if it's done right, it can be done. Yes, if they overlap you know, outside of their area, it becomes an enforcement issue, it becomes a civil issue between Mr. Egan and whoever and Mr. Yokobaskis and anyone who has interfered with their property. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, like the guardrail, he's, what the town engineer is telling me is, there are some styles of guardrail that can be mounted so that you provide a little bit more width for the travel way. So he wasn't saying the, the width of the, of the travel way with the guardrail made the project not feasible. He was asking the applicant to look at some other ways of mounting a guardrail so that you could still preserve some extra space. But I've asked you know, the fire chief and the town engineer and the code officer, can this be done? And they're all like, yeah. They can't give me a reason why I can't. Is it going to be challenging? Absolutely. And, and costly. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Anyone want to offer their comments on? I mean, we, I can ask for a motion or uh, well, you get sort of a sense of I, where this I is going. A, I have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead. For the applicant, I mean for the, uh, the abutter, in fact, attorney Vinny Otis. Uh, and this is a little bit of a stretch, but I mean, it's a very interesting set of facts here. We, we got uh, a lot that, and somebody corrected me, got some of them wrong. It was apparently created in good faith years and years ago. Uh, leaving this uh, access point, this 20-foot. Now we've got uh, a series of regulations that now uh, seem somewhat difficult to comply with. Um, the applicant has uh, made some, apparently, some good faith effort to obtain easements to construct this at a little less expense. Um, but the question, legal question I have for you is, I mean, isn't this just, if, if we refuse the application, if we deny this application, isn't this a taking? I mean, isn't this, I mean, wh wh why isn't it, is I, I guess when I'm at the point we're at in this application? Um, no, I don't think it's a taking. Uh, Cape Elizabeth, I think, has already been through that case, and uh, the courts decided that even though a property may be rendered unbuildable, that's not a taking if there are valid regulatory reasons why the property is unbuildable. Uh, this, this is a, a non-conforming lot which the current ordinance would allow to be built upon provided certain standards can be met. Right. And a waiver would have to be granted in this case. Right. Uh, if you were looking at this from the normal view of you know, takings law is very much related to variance law, the whole notion of was the hardship somehow self-created. Uh, somebody configured this lot this way long before Mr. Egan was in the picture. Um, they only left themselves 20 feet. Uh, most people leave themselves at least 50 because that's typically the standard within which you can put a road that's going to meet passable engineering standards. But no, so, I, 20 some odd years ago when this was created. Oh, I, no, I think even, even 20 some odd years ago, if you look even at subdivision regulations and ordinances, in fact, you can look at plans all over the state where at least 30 feet was typically left to, to leave room to construct the road. But the short answer is, I think, no, because of the way the town's ordinances are structured. If, if the board finds that this would have an adverse impact on abutting properties and potentially create safety issues, I don't, don't think it's a regulatory taking. Uh, however, I'm not the town's attorney. That's the disclaimer, well, obviously. Them. David. Uh, I think we need to also look at a couple other things that were brought up since our last meeting. One is the the uh, area or the type of structure that would be built and the uh, footprint that we would allow for setbacks um, and how they affect uh, the view that other neighbors would have of it. 
Um, so I really I think we there hasn't been any discussion of that, but I think it's important. We, you know, one of the things that I think that the neighbors are concerned about is that here we have a, a lot that somebody's going to buy, but they don't have any idea how large the house is going to be. And, uh, um, but we don't typically look at that. Well, we do from a standpoint that, that we don't leave it up to the uh, code enforcement officer. We tend to want to see what kind of structure it is and how it affects uh, the, the view from other neighbors. But we're, in the, we're in the regulations to say we're supposed to do that in this case. I mean, the, the regulations quite specifically say building envelope, which we all understand is, you know, basically within the setbacks and other parts of the ordinance, uh, that's how they define that. I mean, there's a specific section of the regulations that talk about a building footprint, and I don't see anywhere in, in the regulations that we're supposed to consider tonight that we're supposed to apply a building footprint. That's not, if, if you can show me, Dave, I guess I'd, I'd yeah, I guess I guess I can't show you, but I think it's, you know, it needs to be talked about. Mm -hmm. I think it is in there, actually. Yeah. It's referred to it. His letter, have any of his letter? 1979. It is in a report about a house in terms of the runoff or the source system. Well, the That'll be a five dimensions bedroom, which is a big house. Um, I just asked that town planner to address that issue, if, if you wouldn't mind chiming in. I, I did ask the, the town attorney about this issue because, in fact, um, the ordinance does say you can ask for building footprints, not just building envelope. It has always been the practice of the board with private access way permits only to ask for building envelopes. However, um, you could ask for a building footprint the applicant not knowing, not wishing to build on the lot himself and making mm. it clear that they right. want to sell the house could put on the plans a standard 24 by 36 cape with a two car garage and it meets the standard for showing you a building footprint. And if you meant, if you thought it meant all the criteria, you could prove that. I'm just laying out a scenario to you where six months down the road, right. the lot is sold, the new owner doesn't want a 24 by 36 cape with a two car garage and they just bring in a revised building footprint to you. And my guess is that as long as it meets the standards and it's still within the building envelope, I can't imagine a situation where the planning board wouldn't approve it anyway. So, you know, if we want to make this process a two-step process for people who are selling lots as opposed to just building on them, certainly the board can do that by requiring the exact building footprints. But we haven't done that for, for this reason. That it, all it does is it seems to add additional uh, review and cost that doesn't seem to be providing any real benefit in the type of development you get. Barbara. Well, if we're talking about how things look from the abutters, um, and, and first I want to state that I feel for all sides. I feel for the person who inherited the lot and might not be able to develop it. And I feel for the abutters who are going to be looking at this very awkward structure that in my mind, as I look at these pictures, they're very nice pictures for a commercial development. But for a single family residence, I really have trouble envisioning this. And so when we talk about what we're looking at and whether we're um, interfering with the neighbors, this has got to have an effect on especially the abutters that are right next door to it. Um, the, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce okay. your I'm name. And I, I'm very troubled. I'd like people to talk to each other and try to solve the problem instead of trying to make this the most difficult building project that ever came before, you know, one of them. Uh, <laughs> we seem to be getting a lot of them. <laughs> Anyway, I, I wish there was another solution to this problem because I feel for both sides of you, and I think we probably all do. And to sort of along those lines, my frustration with the abutters, and no offense is attended, is it's sort of an invited problem. There is perhaps a way around this if you chose to work with this property owner, but you don't have to. So I respect that, but it, it, it's a bit frustrating sitting up here uh, when we're trying to figure out a way to minimize the impact and w what you're just saying is no, 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 uh, it, it doesn't leave us with much in the way of options. My guess is if we were to approve this and it were to survive an appeal, 
you'd probably become very interested in working with the, with the property owner to consider giving them easements and so forth because you probably wouldn't want to see that uh, wall go up. Um, I know that's not really my issue, but that's just sort of the reality of the situation and it's, it's a bit frustrating. Um, but I have the same concerns that Barbara has. It, it, it seems like for this area, uh, a rather large scale change uh, that is, we're not accustomed to seeing uh, in this scenario. Um, of course, we haven't really encountered it, but it, it, it seems a, a bit far afield for a residential property. Uh, I, I'm not sure I feel like I have enough to necessarily approve tonight, and if the applicant were to come back next month with uh, perhaps revised plans showing the larger uh, culverts, uh, maybe we could get somewhere on the issue of pooling or, fl or ponding or flooding, I'm sorry. You know, the last project we looked at, we required that the um, developer meet with the abutters and try to come up with some kind of a solution. Maybe we can do the same thing here. Ask all of you to please get together and try to come up with some kind of a rational, equitable solution to the problem, whether it be that the abutters sell the person who's inherited the land, um, Ms. Dregan, the the amount of land he would need just to put in to have a 30-foot easement, maybe that's a solution. Maybe it's to somehow or other divide up the land and everybody buys a share and everybody has a larger lot and that's sort of a win-win situation. But can't we do that? We did that the last time. So it's a little different. It's, yeah, I, it's, I mean, it seems to me this is a different situation. Okay. Uh, they're, they're free to, go ahead, Maureen. Uh, Mr. Schenkel. Before the applicant submitted their application, I asked them to pursue this. And they provided me with information that they had, in fact, written letters to both, ap both abutters asking for that. So, I mean, certainly you could pursue that and say they actually have to all be in the room together at the same time and talk about it. But Any further discussion? At this point, does anybody want to, anyone do, do all these conditions, like the, the, there were some things from the town engineer with regard to cut, showing how the vegetation would look or where it was going to be cut, and also the issue with the 15-inch drain, would that be, con if, if this, this application was approved, would that just be conditional with these things? Yeah. Maureen. If, if the board is going to consider a motion for approval tonight, the applicant is correct that I have not drafted any findings of fact related to resource protection permit standards. That wasn't the applicant. That well, it was the representative of the applicant. Uh, no, no. Oh, it was the, the, the abutter. I'm sorry, the abutter, yes. Um, so if you were to consider a motion like that, we would need to add those findings in. Which would be under? Section 19A3. I'm trying to get a handle okay. on. Go ahead, Peter. I have a motion for the board to consider. Okay. All right. And, um, I propose that we make the following findings of fact. I move that we make the following findings of fact. Don Elliott is requesting a private access way permit and a resource protection permit for a lot located at 43 Hannaford Cove Road. Correct, Marine? 
in order to make the lot eligible for a building permit. The lot is 45,262 square feet and located in an RA district where the minimum lot size is 80,000 square feet. As a legal non-conforming lot located in the RA district, only one single family home is permitted by the zoning ordinance. The proposed lot will have only one dwelling unit and related could you, could you speak up a little? Please? Sorry. Will will have only one dwelling unit and related accessory buildings and uses. Two, based on the project oh, plan. Excuse me. Uh, procedurally, and what we did last time was to vote on each finding of fact as we go along. So you've made a motion with respect to finding of fact number one. You want to go through each one at a time? I think we okay. probably ought to. Okay. Um, so is there a second on that? Second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding of fact number one? Okay. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Peter, would you mind just continuing? No, that's fine. Okay, thank I you. I don't mind at all. I'm just uh, want to get the, what we're doing correct here. Uh, finding fact number two, based on the project plan, the proposed access way shall be located within a dedicated right of way 20.63 feet wide. This is a reduction from the 30 foot requirement and based on the final comments of the fire chief in his memo dated June 16, 2006, <coughs> will provide adequate access for emergency vehicles. Motion has been made and seconded by John. Any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion with respect to finding of fact number two? It carries unanimously. Okay. Number three is designed on the plans the access way will be improved with a paved drive constructed with a sub-base constructed of, with gravel meeting M. Dot specification 703.06 type D with a depth of at least 15 inches in paved and having a width of 14 feet except where the wall would be constructed and a lesser width provided to accommodate a guardrail. The maximum grade within the first 50 feet of the edge of the street will be 5%. Pavement radius at the intersection will be 20 feet to the west and 10 feet to the east. I, the, well, we, can we? Um, I mean, actually, procedurally, I think we just need to have the motion and second it, then we can have further discussion. I'm sorry. Okay. And, and I, if I have second deviated from that in the prior yes. two, I apologize. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded. Now, Barbara, you have a question? Well, we're saying what it is, but we're not saying whether or not it's damaging, you know. And it you, you're concerned we're not reaching the issue? Well, I don't think we are right now. I, I mean, maybe, maybe further down we will, but I, I don't think. I, I would you know, agree with Barbara's down. concern that we're not. I mean, uh, the, the problem is, does this kind of a construction belong in a single family neighborhood? I don't think it does. Well, at this point, we're making findings. We haven't got uh, okay. to an approval. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. And, and honestly, I, I think maybe your debate is appropriate when we have a second on this part of the motion as to whether we should approve this finding or not, right? I mean, are we, do we have a second on the motion yet? We do. We do. Yeah. I mean, it, would it make sense to have a motion to, uh, with respect to a, or a finding of fact that addresses that issue, so then that would be the time where you could vote yay or nay, that you, you, you don't think that this is minimizing the impact. And I forgot the exact terminology that comes from the ordinance. I think minimize was the operative verb, minimize the impact on the abutter's, prop impact on the abutter's property. Maureen. The specific language is the planning board may reduce the requirements of subsections B1, 2, and 3, and this is one of those, to a lesser standard where there is an existing private access or to promote better neighborhood development. But in no case shall standards be reduced so that access for any municipal emergency vehicle is prohibited. So maybe we need to add the words does promote better neighborhood development and then we can either vote yay or nay on that or does that come later well i'm not i was reading in the wrong place so. no I'm, 
I, I made the motion, and right now I'm not willing to amend this particular okay. finding for that. It may come up later, and Barbara, you're perfectly, I mean, anyone can make the, a finding, a proposed motion for a finding. And at this point, I, I'm going to stand by the okay, motion, so that, that finding that I have, number three, and I, I think John seconded it. Mm -hmm. Is there any further discussion? There's a spot here. Yeah, All those in favor of the motion? I have to read it again. Opposed? There are five in favor. I, Barbara just wanted another minute. I'm still reading it. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> well, I guess it just states what's in there, so that's fine. So are you voting in favor, Barbara? Yeah, it, it just states what's in the plan. Right. Okay, so the motion carries unanimously with respect to finding number three. <clears throat> uh, finding proposed finding number four, based on the project plans, gutter drainage along the street will not sheet across the face of the intersection with Hannaford Cove Road. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by David Griffin. Any further discussion? All those in favor? All those opposed? I, I have no idea whether we're not, so I'll vote against it. Okay, so the motion carries five to one. Proposed finding number five, based on the plan's conformance with the turnaround design included in the subdivision ordinance, a turnaround is provided that meets the requirements of the fire chief. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding of fact number five? Motion carries unanimously. Proposed finding number six, the ac access way is located so that 150 feet of site distance is available to the west with the removal of vegetation within the Hannaford Cove Road right away, and the existing site distance exceeds 150 feet to the east. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll well, second it. It's been seconded by John. Any further discussion? All those in favor of? Yes, John. I think, do we? Well, there was a, wasn't there a comment by the town engineer that the plans should show this? Does that get included at the end, or should it be in here? Uh, the way the... I, I mean, I think we should... Come, we should well, my, uh, later on, there would be an opportunity to, well, on the approval conditions. I mean, this is a finding of fact. Fine. Okay. Any well, I think we need to... Um, make sure that even in the finding of fact that all that vegetation exists in the right of way. But Barbara, the, the, the proposed finding says with the removal of vegetation. It, it already, I understand that, but if it's on somebody's property, they're not going to allow it to be no, removed. No. Therefore, the we next, don't have a The next phrase is within the Hannaford Cove Road. Oh, right, right of away. No. Okay. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding number six? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get the count. Could you, we have five in favor? Uh, well, I'm not sure that it's all in the right of way because it's not on the plans. I don't know whether it is or not, so I'll vote against it. Okay, so that's five to one. The motion carries. Uh, Peter? On uh, number seven, the planning board finds that reducing the right of way width from 30 feet to 20 feet, reducing the gravel base from 18 feet wide to 16 feet wide, reducing the traveled way from 14 feet to 11.5 feet where the guardrail is installed and reducing the pavement radius from 20 feet to 10 feet on the in eastern side of the driveway promotes better neighborhood development and maintains access for any municipal emergency vehicle. The motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by David. Is there any discussion on this particular motion? Already said everything. Okay. I mean, the the only thing that that I will add is this: these are the types of uh, reductions that we have approved in other applications for private access way permits, uh, where we've had physical constraints on the properties. Um, and Maureen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that this, this has been a pretty common practice of this board. So, notwithstanding all of the concerns of these abutters, I am inclined to vote in favor of this. Uh, motion for finding in fact number seven. Well, I'm inclined to vote against it because of those very important words, promotes better neighborhood development. And I, I agree. I don't think we've had a case that's really significantly like this before. You're referring to other precedents, which we've, re we've reduced the uh, width of the right of way. 
it hasn't been a case like this at all. So this is a much more sensitive case than the other ones you referred to. Any further comments or discussion? All those of, in favor of the motion with respect to finding of fact number seven? We have four in favor. All those opposed? Two opposed. Motion carries. Finding, proposed finding number eight, based on the memorandum from the code enforcement officer, Bruce Smith, adequate disposal of sewage will be provided as evidenced by the submission of a completed HHE 200 form designing a septic system that meets town, the town sewage ordinance. We have a motion with respect to finding in fact number eight. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by David Griffin. Any further discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries unanimously. Uh, number nine, based on the project plans, a building envelope is depicted where the house and accessory buildings will be located on the lot, demonstrating conformance with the setback requirements of the district in which it is located and net any natural constraints, and that the house site will be buffered from abutting residential properties. Motion has been made with respect to finding number nine. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by David Griffin. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Uh, five in favor. All those opposed? I'll just abstain from this one. The motion carries. And before I treat number 10, um, so I get this section correct. It's page 176, Maureen. The resource permit protection permit standards, there are 10. Do we want to treat each one individually or do we treat them as a group? I think it would be That's fine. preferable. Uh, then I'm going to call this one number 10, Maureen, and A, B, C down the line just so we can keep it straight. It's not going to match up with this numbering. It's actually the reverse. But <laughs> um, uh, I move that based on the information presented, the alteration as proposed with specified conditions of approval will not materially obstruct the flow of surface or subsurface waters across or from the alteration area. And I'm sorry, what finding of fact number is that? That would be 10A. 10A, thank you. Is there a second? Can you repeat that? I'm more than happy to repeat it. Uh, OK. I'm sorry? It might be easier if you did 10 points. I want to match you up, that's fine. OK. So it's. My habit is to change the. <laughs> but whatever works. 10.1. Uh, okay, there's a motion with respect to finding a fact number 10.1. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Griffin. Any further discussion? Well, I, I'm a little concerned about this one. Um, I think that we should, there should be some conditions at least that we, <laughs> we look at a larger size drain. Um, I think the, f you know, I think there's enough evidence here to at least ask the question if the flow rates are going to be substantially higher through that drain, then I think we ought to look at the larger drain. And I think the applicant has been willing to look at that, so. Meaning if it changes, I mean, we've already heard some suggestion that there's been some issues out there already that apparently exist. And you're saying if it gets worse and the applicant's willing to try to ameliorate that, you're, you want that as part of the condition. I think, I think if a larger drain would help move things along there, then we ought to approve that now. What is the size of the? Oh, it's 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 15. And the applicant has indicated a willingness to install 15 inch. So I think that's just a condition that we put at the end, but that's. Yeah, 
Peter, would it make sense to include uh, that condition I, I, at the end? Well, I'm thinking I could amend this finding to say that uh, based on the information presented, the alteration is proposed uh, with the changes as proposed by, and I, I, sorry, I forgot his name, the, the, that the applicant is willing to agree to. That is a specified condition of approval that will not materially interfere with the obstruction of flow, et cetera, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so essentially, there's a in this finding, there's a requirement that the size of the culvert be increased from 12 inches to 15 inches. Is that, that's the way I would read that. Let me make a comment. I'd rather have it say that um, it was increased to whatever size was required so there was no ponding on the abutting property. Well, any worse than is there now. Right, any worse right. than is there now. Yeah. There isn't any now. That's what I thought. They claim there isn't any. That's on the... I don't know how that works. I mean, we oh, approve this. If we approve this entire application with the 15 inch culverts and then it turns out well, we got years to. from now there's ponding, I don't, I don't know if we've ever had a, con a condition like this where they would have to go back and. Well, they, they know when they come up with a design for a culvert that there's a certain amount of head pressure required to get water to flow through there at a certain rate. That head pressure comes from a pond that forms at the head of the culvert. So they can design the culvert to be very, very large so that pond has to be substantially smaller than it would be otherwise. Go ahead, Maureen. The town stormwater regulations do not prohibit ponding. What they require is that you have to provide stormwater structures that can accommodate a 2, 10, and 25-year storm. So a storm that is larger than a 25-year storm, there's going to be ponding. So ponding all over town because we don't require structures larger than that. Uh, the applicant has submitted a, tra uh, a study uh, prepared by an uh, engineer who actually is our alternate engineer when OST Associates can't do work for us. Um, not that that's any part of the issue here, but he has some credibility. He says it's big enough. The applicant is saying they're willing to increase it to a larger size. The abutting property owner has 15-inch 15, 15 culvert. I would just urge the planning board to try to be specific in your conditions because an open-ended so that right. there's no ponding probably there's no way you can enforce that. Well, ponding on one's own property is one thing, but ponding on a flooding, that's another word for flooding someone else's property, is a different matter. Like I said, you're only required to take care of the two, 10, and 25 percent. To be quite frank. But we don't have to be supportive of it if we believe it's negatively impacting others. Minimizing, and, and minimum, and minimum, just, minimally. If the, if, the, if the planning board members are that in, insecure or uncertain with the information that's been provided to them that they don't feel comfortable making a specific condition, mm -hmm. then this isn't ready for final action. Right. I think that's the case. Barbara. Now, this property was inherited in 1980. It's now 2006. If we are unsure about this question, why not ask the applicant to come back next time with some more specific information? After 26 years, I cannot see that another month is going to make any difference. Well, I, I agree with all of that. I, I'm just suggesting we move through some of the other items, and if we hold this one out. But if we're going to hold this one out, then why move through the other items? Well, because some of them may be not contentious, and we can move through this. I mean, Dave, it's the chair's like, it's prerogative to decide which way we're going to go. It, it, and, and I'll abide by the majority wishes on that. Uh, it just seems to me we've got a lot of people here in data, and let's just move through what we can. And if we all have this one thing that we're not quite sure of, and I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Maureen's saying, if we're uneasy because of data, inadequate data, one way or the other, pro or con, let's get it and make a decision, an intelligent decision. So essentially, uh, Peter, it, it, if the board is not satisfied that we have enough to vote to approve finding a fact 10.1, right. that, that motion with, with respect to that finding a fact might fail, possibly tonight. Uh, and then you are still proposing that we go through the rest of this to see if there's, uh, well, uh, I mean, what you want to do is to continue going through the findings of fact, have the votes on them, and if some others fail, then the applicant knows what they may have to come back exactly. and present to us. Uh, how, procedurally, would we then have to have a motion to table? I, I, before there's an approval motion. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> uh, you, what, procedurally, what you should do, 
to be honest, if you go through all your findings of fact, and if at least one of your findings of fact fails, then you should not be approving a project. Well, I agree. So if you made, then made the subsequent motion to approve, my hope would be that that motion would fail. Correct. And if that motion would fail, you still have to find a way to dispose of this item tonight with a motion that does pass. So the next logical motion would be either a motion to table or a motion to deny. Okay. okay. Is everyone comfortable with that approach? All right, so we have a motion with respect to 10 point, finding of fact 10.1. We've had some discussion where some board members feel that more information is going to be necessary, so they, you know, but we need to vote. So, well, I'll, go ahead. My proposal on this, frankly, is I would be willing to abstain, I'm going to abstain on this motion because I don't have adequate information to make a finding one way or the other. The problem with an abstention, I mean, it seems to me if, 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 if you're abstaining, what you're really doing is voting against it because you don't feel like the applicant has you sustained carried its burden. burden of proof okay. for us tonight. So I think I would encourage board members not to abstain okay. in the future, Given frankly. Uh, when we've had a five to one vote or when we've had a clear majority, it hasn't been an issue. But here, if you feel like you don't have enough information, then you should vote against it. Uh, no, that's that makes the most sense. That analysis, I would agree. All right. So all of those in favor of finding in fact, the motion with respect to finding in fact 10.1. All of those against. Okay. The motion does not carry. So the likely result is we are faced at the end of this process, after we go through the rest of these, with a motion to deny or a motion to table. Uh, so I, I think it does make sense to continue on, but if, if, if others disagree with me, let me know. No, I agree with Louis. Okay. All right. Because some of these others may actually affect this same issue, and let's get those out there. together. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> proposed motion 10.2, uh, that based on the information presented, the alteration is proposed uh, with the amendment as proposed by the uh, abutter or agreed to by the applicant with specified conditions of approval will not impound surface waters or reduce the absorpt absorptive capacity of the alteration area so as to cause or increase the flooding of adjacent properties. To me, this well, so we have to give a second before you. Yeah, ahead. is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. To me, this is a similar issue. Yeah, uh, yeah I think so too. And anything to add to this? All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Okay. Uh, proposed motion 10.3. I'm sorry, just to make the record clear, the motion failed zero to six. Okay. Go ahead, Peter. Sorry, to wait for the share. Uh, Proposed motion 10 point, uh, finding of fact 10.3, that, that based on the information presented, the, al the alteration as proposed with the amendment as proposed by the abutter and agreed by the applicant with the specified conditions of approval will not increase the flow of waters across or the discharge of surface waters from the alteration areas so as to threaten injury to the alteration area or to upstream and or downstream lands by flooding, drainage, erosion, sedimentation, or otherwise. Motion has been made. Is there a second? second? It's been seconded by Mr. Griffin. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Yeah, the motion fails zero to six. Okay. Uh, proposed finding of fact uh, 10.4 that based on the information presented, the alteration is proposed with specified conditions of approval will not result in significant damage to spawning grounds or habitat for aquatic life, birds, or other wildlife. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Seconded by Mr. Griffin. It seems to me we're getting into a different area. I agree with you. There has been no evidence that there's any impact, but that's... Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Uh, motion carries six. It's unanimous. Uh, proposed finding of fact 10.5, that based on the information presented, the alteration is proposed with specified conditions of approval will not pose problems related to the support of structures. 
Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by John. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding of fact 10.5? It's unanimous. The motion carries. Uh, proposed findings of fact 10.6, that based on the information presented, the alteration as proposed with specified conditions of approval will not be detrimental to aquifer recharge or the quantity or quality of groundwater. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Seconded by David Griffin. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to finding 10.6? Uh, it's four in favor. All those opposed? Two opposed. Motion carries. Proposed. Is that Dave? Yes. Proposed findings of fact number 10.7, that based on the information presented, the alteration is proposed uh, with specified conditions of approval will not disturb coastal dunes or, or contiguous back dune areas. Is there a second? Second. It's been seconded by John with respect to finding 10.7. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Carries unanimously. I propose findings of fact uh, 10.8 that based on the information presented, the alteration as proposed with specified conditions of approval will maintain or improve geolog ge ecological and aesthetic values. I need some more water. <laughs> the motion has been made. Is there a second? second? It's been seconded. Any further discussion on finding of fact 10.8? All those in favor of finding 10.8? Three in favor? All those opposed? Three opposed. Motion does not carry. If I, if I is there water yeah, down in that? That one empty too. Thanks, Dave. Uh, proposed finding uh, ten point nine that based on the information presented, the alteration is proposed with specified conditions of approval will maintain, maintain an adequate buffer area between the wetlands, wetland and adjacent land uses. Is there a uh, motion has been made with respect to finding 10.9? Is there a second? Seconded by David Griffin. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion uh, five in favor. All those opposed? One opposed. Motion carries five to one. I propose finding to fact 10.9. 10, that based on the information presented, the alteration as proposed with specified conditions of approval will be accomplished in conformance with the erosion prevention provisions of the Environmental Quality Handbook, Erosion and Sediment Control, published by the Maine Soil and Water Conservation Commission dated March 1986 or subsequent revisions thereof. Motion has been made and Second. seconded by John Siegfried. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion with respect to 10.10? 10? Uh, motion carries unanimously. I propose finding 10.11 that based on the information presented, the alteration is proposed with specified conditions of approval will be accomplished without discharging wastewater from buildings or from other construction into wastewater treatment facilities in violation of Section 15-1-4 of the Sewage Ordinance. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Seconded by David Griffin. All those in favor of the motion with, oh, excuse me. Any further discussion with respect to finding 10.11? Uh, All those in favor of the motion? Uh, all those opposed? That was unanimous. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> proposed finding 10.12 that based on the information presented, the alteration is proposed with specified conditions of approval, will 
in the case of resource protection permits in the resource protection floodplain district also comply with section 6-6-6 of the floodplain management ordinance is this mm -hmm. okay uh, the motion has been made is there a second the motion is seconded uh, town planner is indicating that this would not apply I'm assuming because we're because it, it says in the resource protection floodplain district. Okay, this, is this isn't right. Okay. okay, so we don't need we don't need that finding. Yeah, right. Amen. So do you? So I, would, I would draw. I would draw that the motion. motion. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we're then on to. At this point, I'm not prepared to. Well, do we want to put 10.11 on the table? It's not 10.11, it would be finding, finding number 11. 11, number 11. Sure. Well, you don't have to make a motion if you're not. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I have no more findings of fact that I would like to Fine. find or move to find. Okay. Does anybody else have any more findings of fact that they would like to make a motion regarding? Uh, it, 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 it would appear that based on the fact that a number of these did not uh, carry that we are left with a choice to either deny the application or we could move to table it. I have a question for the town planner. If, if we move to table, do we need consents from anyone at this point of the process? No. no. So we can table it. At, yeah, the, the night of the public hearing, you can always table it. Oh, that's right. We just opened that tonight. That's right. I thought we had one meeting once already. I see, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion to make. Okay. Let's Go ahead. Uh, I move that, uh, that the application of Don Elliott for a private access, access way permit to make the lot buildable and the resource protection permit to construct a driveway across a wetland for a lot located at 43 Hannaford Cove Road be tabled until the August 15th, 15th, 2006 meeting of the planning board. Motion has been made. Is there a second? It's been seconded by Mr. Griffin. Any further discussion? I th I, all those in favor of the motion to table? It's unanimous. <clears throat> so at this point, we, uh, I, I think, I hope that you have enough uh, direction from, from us as to what we need to see next month. But I would encourage you to continue to work with the town planner and address your questions to her if you have any uncertainty as to, as to what we need to see next month. Okay, thank you. I think it's just for the record, Dave, is, is this, this was submitted as part of the rec our record? Yeah. Yes. This was submitted tonight. This is yours, part of the file. Yeah. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the Winnick Woods Master Plan Resource Protection Permit. The, 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 thank you. Thank you. Not the Town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a resource protection permit to alter 2,160 square feet of RP2 wetlands with trail crossings on the Winnick Woods property located on Sawyer Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. Uh, tonight we have uh, Jonah Rosenfield from the Conservation Commission. When you are ready, sir, uh, we ask you to come forward to the podium and summarize the project for us. Hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. Uh, and thank you for your patience. Uh, and I realize it's a bit late. Yes, and I, for better or for worse, you do not have an audience here. <laughs> I know, where'd everybody go? <laughs> um, on behalf of the town of Cape Elizabeth, the Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission is requesting a resource protection permit for wetland trail crossings as shown in the Winnick Woods Master Plan, which I believe you all have a copy of, as well as up here on, on the bulletin board. Winnick Woods is a 71-acre parcel of land that was donated to the town of Cape Elizabeth in the 1990s by Alice Larea, 
Uh, it was once a farm. Um, the land contains a little place to pull the race track, fields and forest, and Mrs. Luria restricts the use of this piece of land for passive use. In, 2000, um, in January of this year, of 2006, the town council approved the master plan for Winnick Woods. And the master plan out, um, lays out trails throughout it that are intended to provide the public with access to the land through loop trails, as well as connector trails to Cross Hill um, and the abutting Dyer Hutchison Farm areas. Uh, the trails were designed uh, to provide public access while minimizing the impact on wetlands and the natural character of the land. The resource protection permit that we're asking for tonight is requested to alter up to 2,060 square feet of wetland areas. Um, and this estimate is based on the wetland mapping done by Woodlot Alternatives. Uh, you can see the areas on this map, which I believe you have a copy of, um, numbers 1 through 12. Uh, and I believe you also have a copy of the projected square foot that would be um, altered in each case on this piece of paper that looks something like this. Uh, while trails are shown on the map, the actual locations of the trails will vary because the way that we actually create these trails with the Conservation Commission and volunteers is we go out there and we field site the trails. So these are the appropriate or the approximate areas, but they will change based on um, our decisions to minimally impact large trees, wetland areas, that sort of thing. Um, so actually the impact would hopefully um, be less than the requested 2,060 square feet. Um, usually the Conservation Commission in the past has used two different types of construction type. Where there are streams or other um, flowing larger bodies of water, we build simple bridges that are generally six feet wide. Um, and where there's just wet or damp areas, we'll build um, kind of thin, uh, two, using two by 12, two two by 12 planks of boardwalk uh, to cross over those areas. Like if you've, if you've been to the areas of Great Pond or in back of Gullcrest, those sorts of things. One area um, that we actually have an Eagle Scout ready to do some work on is the trailhead area off of Sawyer Road, number one right here. And that would actually be an eight foot wide bridge so that the town could bring over uh, mowing uh, equipment so they were able to mow, mow the meadow, take care of maintenance of the meadow. But in most cases, the bridge would be six feet, six feet wide. Um, and that would be depending on uh, the type of crossing. And like I said, in just the damp or, 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 or less wet areas, there would be the, the thin boardwalks. Uh, in addition to the resource protection permit, uh, we're also asking uh, a, 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 the following waivers. Number one is the maximum site plan scale of 100 feet. The submitted plan is at a scale of one inch equals 300 feet. Uh, number two, topographical information. Number three, soils information. Number four, flow direction of water courses. And number five, storm water runoff plan. Um, that's all the information I really have to share. If anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Uh, actually, the first order of business for us to uh, review is completeness. Uh, and if, we, if there are any issues that we deem to be incomplete, uh, then we need to identify that information and no substantive discussion is to occur. Uh, uh, are there any comments on the issue of completeness or questions that the board wishes to raise? Uh, Barbara. I have a motion for the board to consider. Okay. Um, motion for completeness be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for a resource protection permit to alter 2,060 square feet of RP2 wetlands with trails with trail crossings on the Winnick Woods property located on Sawyer Road be deemed complete. Is there a second? Seconded by David Griffin. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion on completeness? The motion carries unanimously. Uh, we actually did uh, advertise or provide notice of a public hearing tonight. Uh, so I will now open the public hearing. Um, and now I will close the public hearing because there's no one here. Uh, so uh, we now have the option of uh, beginning substantive review of this application. Uh, and we also can discuss whether we feel the need to uh, do a site walk prior to entertaining a, a motion for approval. 
I, it's, I, I go a, ahead, John. I had a question. Um, what does passive use entail? Passive use, I, I believe in marine, you can speak to this more directly, but uh, I believe it, it means non-motorized okay. use. So I believe bicycling is fine, um, but no, no motor cross yeah. or, or, or those sort of things. So hiking, skiing, walking, that sort of yeah. activity. The, the issue just comes up because is a big problem in Cross Hill now, with, with especially with the wet weather. The bikes do lots of right. lots of damage, and it almost makes it impossible to walk. Then, so I, yeah, I mean it's another it's another issue, but I I just didn't if it, it does passive mean bikes, and so we, you know, this is a potential problem for here as well. But that's another. I think I believe passive issue. does mean bicycles. Is that right? Barbara? There's a definition in, on page 15, and it says, yeah. including but not limited to walking, picnicking, hiking, those of an informal nature do not take place at prescribed sites or fields and usually do not require extensive equipment. Passive recreation does not involve active team sports or the use of motorized vehicles. So it would include bikes, I think. So. Uh, uh, just was having an informal discussion with the town planner, I think that would be the sort of thing if there were damage to the trails, the town could come in perhaps with the recommendation of the Conservation Commission and restrict the use of bicycles during certain seasons perhaps, but I'm not sure we necessarily need to hold it up on that. And I know you're not suggesting yeah. that, but I, mean, I, I know I've expressed an interest in a site walk, but I'm not sure I need to, I think I just want to see it to see it, but I'm not sure I need to see it for purposes of uh, voting on an approval of the application tonight. Uh, we ha this has been the subject of a few workshops uh, already, uh, and at least I would be comfortable moving forward on a motion to approve un unless there's any opposition to that. And it's not just a function of it being 9 o'clock. <laughs> Barbara. Well, I, I would just like to compliment the Conservation Commission. I think you did a really great job on the... Thank you on the um, Winnick Woods plan, master plan, and are obviously, and I loved that you're not going to remove any trees and really are very mindful as you would be of the ecological Yeah, and, and that's really the principle nature. behind field locating the trails. Thank you. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, uh, and I would like to echo Barbara's comments. I, I think this is going to be a, a great asset to the town of Cape Elizabeth. So thank you for all of your hard work on this. Uh, you want a motion? Yes, please. Motion for approval. Finding a fact. Number one, the town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting a resource protection permit to alter 2,000 60 square feet of RP2 wetland with trail crossing on. Winnick Woods property located on Sawyer Road, which requires review under section 19-8-3 resource protection permit regulations. Number two, the application substantially complies with section 19-8-3 resource protection regulations. There be, therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and the materials submitted, and the facts presented, the application of the town of Cape Elizabeth for a resource protection permit to alter 2,060 square feet of RP2 wetlands with trail crossings on Winnick Woods prop property located on Sawyer Road be approved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded by, made by David Griffin, seconded by Jack Keneally. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion? It carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I ask a motion to adjourn, I did mention very briefly, this is John Siegfried's last night with us on the planning board. Uh, John, you have been a tremendous asset to the board. Uh, we regret that uh, your ten work, tenure was uh, short-lived. We know that's not what you clearly wanted, uh, but you've, you've served on the board during a very difficult uh, time. And uh, I, I, for one, appreciate all of your efforts and uh, all of your counsel and advice and input on the projects we've had before us. And you will definitely be missed by us and by the town. So thank you. You're here. Jack, <laughs> and, and, and David. Just keep looking at the website. You'll yeah. <laughs> find out exactly <laughs> what's happened. <laughs> uh, as your last act, would you care to make a motion to adjourn? Okay. 
<laughs> um, on uh, July 18th, I'd like to make a motion for adjourn. Do I have a second? Second it. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you all. Wait, last one. Do, do one. Red side.